Good morning again from the land down under. Brothers and sisters, visitors, welcome. Um, and this is what we have happening right now. I, it's been a long time, right? At least a day. Uh, but I've got a lot more that I need to give to you. And, uh, and so I've, I've had another God dream last night. It, uh, I had it twice, and it's confirmation of confirmation on top of confirmation. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is, I'm, oh, thank you, Sister Paulette. I, I have to take it aside right now, and I, I really love and appreciate our dear sister Paulette, who is the moderator on this channel. She does such an amazing job, and, 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 it, and it can be sometimes a difficult job for her to do and I, I appreciate her so much and uh and i would ask that everyone would would pray for her that uh, you would lift her up as well because she she's doing this out of love for the lord and she's doing it out of love for you and i just want to to just go ahead and praise her because she's got to deal with me and, uh, and, and a lot of times that can be, I think, a little difficult because I don't think there has been a single instance where I contact her early. And I was telling her just this morning, oh my goodness, I have received this urgent information from the Lord that I've got to get online. And I'm going to do it in about 30 minutes. Well, it's never 30 minutes. Uh, I have every intention of it, but Holy Spirit has different ideas and has always given me more. So, you know, and I'm just about to go, go live. No, nope, wait a minute, Wayne. You've got this and I want you to do this. So anyway, I, I just really appreciate you so much, dear sister. And, and so it is wonderful to have you as a part of this ministry. And I appreciate you so much. Um, now that we are here, let me give you a lot more information. So before we start, there, the number of signs that are actually coming to me and the number of things that, that are presenting itself for how close we are and giving me actually more revelation. And, and here is another thing. Some of the revelation and some of the, the things that we're going to be discussing today are actually from the benefit of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and I'm saying this for a specific reason. I am not the do-all and be-all, and neither is anyone else. I think that one of the great things that we have is... <laughs> You know, Jesus gives us each a piece of the puzzle. He gives us each talents and abilities. And, but he doesn't give everyone the entire picture. The same thing goes for me. And I think in a lot of times, if you have some really strong messages from Abba, that, you know, it helps keep us humble. It, it helps keep us, it, you know, no one can say, you know, well, I've got this full picture. I've got this full message. God told me here is what the whole answer is. No, it, it doesn't work that way. It's not about that. You don't have unity that way either. So I believe that what he does is he gives me something and it's, and he, uh, wants me to be obedient to tell you, but I can tell you in a lot of instances, just because I'm telling you doesn't mean I have the meaning or the understanding or what all of it is and how it fits together. And many of you, if, if you're familiar with a lot of things that happen on the channel, understand that, right? Um, there are people that uh, I actually had this one comment from a guy that has said, well, you've been saying, talking about me, 
you've been saying that the rapture has been imminent for almost a year now. Well, here's what I would say to that. Yes, I have. And yes, it is absolutely true. And we are at the imminency of imminency, I believe, right now. Would anyone stop to think that if you've got a year of warning that Jesus is not going to spend every second of that time doing as much as he can through as many people as possible to try to wake up the church, to try to wake up people to what's happening in the world, and to bring as many people into the harvest for the bride as possible, or into the church as a whole as possible. Of course he is. And that is exactly what I think is another sign to show us just how close it is. We've been waiting 2,000 years. So is one year, would I be saying that it's imminent? You betcha. Okay. Now let's talk about this before we actually get into this. I want to go ahead and say a prayer again. I, I We have to do this. Holy Spirit is, is so strongly prompting me now. This is what we have to do. Let's do this. Dear Heavenly Father, my Abba, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you. You are, you are beyond words, and, and it is just you are amazingly good. You are an awesome God, and you are worthy to be praised, and we lift you up and praise you now. Lord, give me the ability to praise you as you are worthy to receive, because I don't even have all of the words to to just exalt you and to lift you up. And I want to so desperately. This is a moment when we are so close, when we are about to be harvested up. Your bride is about to be harvested up. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you are going to anoint these words, that Holy Spirit, you are going to reach out uh, uh, through these video lines and the things that are being said that your word, your message is actually going out, that it's going to impact the people, that it's going to make a strong impact on your brothers and sisters. It's going to fill them with the encouragement and the understanding of how late this moment really is. And not only that, that it's going to touch those that come by, that, that those that are curious, that those that are drawn by Abba to come in here and see this, to know that the Jesus that the world has been rejecting is about to come and they can receive our Jesus as Lord and Savior in their lives at this moment, that they might be eternally grateful, that they might lift you up and praise you all the more. I'm asking you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Let's start with this. There is just so much. I want you to know, after my last, just my last message, and what did I cover? So this is actually going to build on what we did this last time. I covered so many instances of where I was seeing the numbers 153. And I, I, <laughs> I was just 153, rapture finish. And that is from uh, John 21. And that discusses the narrative of the great catch of 153 fish. And that how that is a symbol or it is a shadow of the rapture. And, uh, and there's various different reasons for that. Uh, as again, if you haven't read that narrative in John chapter 21, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and, and you are going to see that it is just so filled. Don't look at this, the top layer. Ask Holy Spirit to open up your eyes of understanding. Open up your heart to receive the deeper meanings of what's involved. 
and to ask Holy Spirit to give you that understanding, to give you the wisdom of his word that you might see it. And when you do, it's yours. It's yours. It belongs to you. And I get so excited when I see that. Many, 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 many. Hello, everyone. Yes, sir. Praise God. Praise God. Come on in. Uh, I just want to, to, to say that I covered it so many instances. If you haven't seen just the last message, it is, I, I think, so strong and so powerful, and it was so urgent, uh, the promptings of Holy Spirit, for me to do that, to actually discuss about a premonition of God that was dealing with snow and this snow happening in North Texas in April. And this, and we're going to talk about this more. I'm going to cover it to, uh, some more in some detail to, to explain what's going on. This, of course, happened and, uh, and, and it paved the way for something then that also happened that same year. So at the beginning of this year, I have this God dream or this God premonition, this God vision in which he showed me that it was going to snow in North Texas in April. Now, we're going to cover that later. I'm just telling you, it has it had never, never happened up to this point. And so people were telling me, I was telling people, God showed me it's going to snow in this this April. And so here's what, you know, you want to talk about mockers and scoffers. It was like, okay, Wayne, uh, you need to, you need to, you know, keep it quiet. Um, not say anything about this because um, it, it's not going to snow in April here in Dallas, uh, in Fort Worth. So it, it never has. I don't know why you would say that, but, and, and it got worse. You're freaking out of your mind, man. And, and similar things and some things far worse, but I did not stop. I knew God had shown me it was going to snow. Now I did not know why. I didn't know the meaning or the purpose of it, but that's what he showed me. And that's exactly what happened. And then we'll go into that uh, later on. But then later that year, I had my second afterlife experience. And that was uh, also 1996. And interestingly, seven years after my first one. I, I, I could not possibly have planned this or anything else. I encourage you, if you haven't seen that message, because that's what I'm saying, they're bookends, bookends from my very first message. My very first message on this channel was that testimony, my afterlife testimony. Now, I say this uh, each time. Uh, I don't call it an NDE or a near-death experience. Why? Because I was dead. I was dead. There was no life in my body. It was dead. But the author of that life, the giver of life, Jesus gave me life again. And... So that's what happened in 1989. And, uh, and I indicate as I cover there, and if you haven't seen my first uh, afterlife experience, it was so incredibly powerful. And I contend that what it is, is the actual marriage procession with the, the military angels lining well, the whole tunnel, actually. So it was 360 degrees, but uh, at, and leading up to Jesus and ultimately the consummation, the two becoming one, as I experienced at that union, that communion, 
that uh, oneness, becoming one with God. And um, wow, it's, it's, you, you need to see it if you haven't. So here's the thing. Jesus and the Father both sent me back at the same time. They're, they're one, right? So of course, they're going to do the same thing. But So Jesus sent me back to give this message of his love for each one of you. He actually gave me, he, he took me in this afterlife and he placed me at the foot of his cross at the time he was being crucified. It, I don't want to go into it because it just breaks me apart. It, it is, I can't even discuss it without breaking down. So I'm, I'm just going to let you go back and you take a look at it so that I, I don't have that happen right at the moment. But then what happened seven years later, without knowing why, I actually have a second afterlife experience where I am carried by an angel, and it's a different type of angel. And uh, this angel brings me to Jesus and uh, where I am uh, uh, taken around him. Now, he's actually, as I'm seeing him, he's actually the capstone of a pyramid. It looks like a, well, it looks like a pyramid. It looks like a mountain. It, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's in heaven. He's standing on the top there. It's flat on this top, and it's just him up there. So he represents the capstone, the top. And, uh, and we have this, this is one of the things that, that, that I was discussing in this last one, how uh, the scripture ends up talking about him, uh, Jesus, being the chief cornerstone. And what that meant was that he is what everything is built on, the church is built on him, the cornerstone, but he's also the head. And so he's the capstone. There's uh, uh, numerous places where it discusses both. I know the King James Bible doesn't have the word capstone in it, but it does have the meaning in there. So, I mean, if you've got a problem with that, then just look up the words for heaven's sakes and actually see what the meaning is. So in the Hebrew, it can actually mean cornerstone or capstone, depending upon the context. We know that there are many of those, okay? Uh, Cheryl is asking, I missed the beginning. Did Wayne have another dream? Yes, and you haven't missed it, dear sister. So I'm going to be discussing it as well. So anyway, I've given you that context uh, about this, uh, and, uh, uh, and but there is so much more. So I don't want to go into all of these instances of what happened uh, in the last message. I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, go back and check it out. But let me start by saying this happened just this morning. Okay. Well, let me say. I was awakened by the Lord at several times uh, very early this morning in which I was pointed out various different times and things that were showing up. But rather than show you the dozen other instances that happened just this morning, I'm just going to show you what happened to me right as I started this live stream. And as I was just about to go online and I was finishing up, well, the first thing that happens as I am having to discuss when I'm coming on uh, with dear sister Paulette, well, that's the time that shows up. 1.53, rupture fish, okay? So it happens again. And right as I am about to go on as as I'm I, I'm I'm got everything together, and I'm looking at one piece that I'm going to discuss, and that's about me representing the bride, circling the groom, which is what's done in Jewish weddings. We'll cover that in deeper detail. 
right at that moment, I was prompted immediately to look at my clock on uh, my computer. And it was just because I was involved in this. It was just like, look now. Oh, okay, okay. No way. So I go and grab my phone and I, I, I take a snapshot, which I sent to Paulette. And what was that at that particular moment? 11, 11. Okay, folks, I just want you to know this is, and I really believe it. So what do we have? The rapture, and what do I see 11, 11 as, as representing in this particular case? Judgment. So we have the rapture followed by judgment, just as an example of what happened right as I was going online to do this. Do you understand what I'm saying? And all of these other instances that I haven't even discussed that uh, I, I was awakened at, guess what time this morning? 4.58. And what the eyes are like, what, what time is it? No, Lord. Okay, grab, grab the phone, note it. 4.58. 4.58. God is king. That's what it is in Strong's. That's the song he keeps singing to me. And that is the confirmation that I was needing for the dreams that I had this evening uh, or early this morning. Okay, let's go back because I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead. Let's go back and let's talk about some things because this is some additional information in relation to my last message. Let's wet the whistle. All right, thank you for that. Abba. And, and so this is what I want to say. I want to talk about the dream, okay? Or it's not a dream. It was a premonition. And this premonition happened in January of 1996. Now, I know that there's going to be questions. How can you know that, or how can you even remember that? And how can you know this date? Well, because this is something that was big and it had never happened like that to me in this way. And, uh, and the fact that it then occurred and it freaked everybody out um, and the fact that it was recorded uh, and it's noted as a significant weather event that happened, a record setting weather event. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. So that's how, I remember it, I've never forgotten it. Just like these other things, do you ever forget an afterlife experience? Do you ever forget that? No, actually you don't. And it is, I don't think it's actually possible. When you, when you talk to people about NDEs or near-death experiences or what I'm calling in my instance an afterlife experience, it bypasses your brain. It, it, it doesn't work like normal memories. One of the things I would think that, you know, it would be like this. If any of you understand or have heard any number of NDEs, I'm not talking about whether they're accurate, true, whether they're from the enemy, any, anything like that. I'm not saying that. I want to point out just one particular aspect that you see in a lot of instances that uh, I think relates to the point that I'm saying here. In a lot of instances, you will have people that say that they have a life review and they go through their entire life very quickly, every single moment of it. Now, is it possible for you to remember in your earthly body every single moment of your life? No, I have a hard time remembering what I had for lunch last Tuesday. 
So I got, I mean, so, but why would that happen? Why would they be able to do that then? Well, it's my supposition. It's that's because everything in your life here is recorded in your soul. And it is your soul or spirit. I'm not, I'm not going to say that it's definitely in that one, but it, it's all recorded there. And, uh, and so it doesn't work like through your physical brain. It doesn't have any difficulty recalling anything because it all stays with you. So when I come back, even though the, the memory if you can call it a memory of what had occurred, doesn't it, it, it's like bypassed. It doesn't come from where I had it recorded, you know, from my physical brain, if that makes any sense, okay? And, uh, and so that for that reason, because it comes from that place where it was pristine, you never forget it. You when you actually recall it, it's as if you are reliving every single moment of it again. And that's why it is so strong. That's why so many people are constantly impacted. That's why when they have a, a real death experience in which they see Jesus, in which they uh, are, are, or if they end up in a hellish realm in these particular times and they have to be saved by Jesus, there's there. What I'm saying is, those people, myself included, when you have that type of experience, it changes you for life. You can't, you, you can't see it any other way. Now, I have caveated that particular instance, the enemy also tries to fool those that, uh, in, and, and to make them think other things. This is not about that. You can check that out. But those people then that are deceived by the enemy in their particular instances, they're all over the map. They, I, I don't even want to go that way. What, what I'm saying is, uh, then you've got to be able to understand that this experience in my life changed me so radically, starting with my salvation experience, definitely with my, um, my afterlife experience a week later, but then seven years later, I have my second afterlife experience. And that's what this last message talks about. Now, so what predicated that? And that was this message about the snow. Now, here's the thing. So in 1996, and you have to remember that since I'm a Texas boy, uh, while I, of course, live here in Melbourne, Australia, uh, uh, at, at the time, living uh, right in, in Dallas, Texas. And um, I was given in January this premonition. And in this premonition, I was standing at the window. And, and I'm looking out at snow on the ground. And I then hear this word, April. And I know this word is God. He's speaking to me. He's pointing out this is in April. And I also then know it's the coming April. So, and I'm looking out of the window of the house that I lived in at the time. So, you know, and, and I was, uh, I'm looking at, and it was stunned. I can feel the, I can actually still feel the coldness of it. I can still see the purity and the, uh, of the white 
snow that was there on the ground. And I'm just like looking at it, just really strange. Okay. Now, why this is, uh, um, oh, yes, Dee Dee, uh, I'm going to be discussing that. Now she's, there's an aside. I know I'm looking over here at the, at the chat, but she's going to talk about the uh, circling of the, of me around Jesus represents the bride uh, circling the groom. I discussed that a little bit earlier. I'm going to go into some detail when we discuss this in a little bit. So thank you for that. All right. So when this happened, and of course, then I woke up, the first person I tell, of course, is Denise, my wife. And, and she's saying, I mean, it doesn't snow in April. And I'm, Oh, I couldn't dispute that. Uh, well, I know, but it's going to happen. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen. I, I told my in-laws, I told my family, you know, all of my family who, and then others, friends, I, for some reason, I felt like I had to tell them, okay? I didn't know why. I didn't know what the purpose was, but I felt like I had to tell them. And I knew that it was going, it's going to happen. And so, and did it happen? Yes, it did. So what I did is uh, I had looked up and, and I covered this uh, in my previous message that I looked up on the National Weather Service where they had listed all of the significant North Texas snow and ice events. And I pointed out that this went all the way back to December 25th, 1841, okay? Since that time, not one instance of April. You've got December, you've got February, you've got January. You've got November, you've got all of that, but nothing about April until April 5th, 1996. And this is what it says about that event. Severe drought plagued North Texas throughout the winter months. But this Good Friday brought abundant rainfall and one of the heaviest April snowstorms on record. Some sleet mixed with the rain before a complete transition to snow occurred west of a line from Montague to Weatherford to Eastland, though some light snow fell as far east as Fort Worth. The heaviest snowfall occurred near the I-20 corridor where Sweetwater accumulated 18 inches. The 9.3 inches at Abilene remains an all-time 24-hour record. Six inches fell in Breckenridge. And I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, April the 5th, Good Friday, it snowed. And I remember that morning, I'm standing at the window, just like it was in the premonition. I'm looking outside and my wife comes and says, what you looking at? And I said, come and see. And she walks up and looks out and she just looked at me in shock snowy? And I just went, yes, it is. Then everyone that I told, that's what the, there it was. You, you couldn't deny it, right? And, and there's no way for you to deny it either. But that wasn't all of these neat things. So I cover it in detail on that last message. But what was interesting is 
Brother Danny Hall, 1912, had posted something several times about, now see, what you have to understand is that the National Weather Service is called NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, it's not spelled like we would say, but it's called NOAA. And that harkens back to this, as in the days of Noah, right? Do you understand? That's where I'm getting this. So our brother, Danny Hall, 1912, writes in his comments later. He said, Wayne, you mentioned NOAA, the National Weather Service. It was established in 1870. And then he writes, 2023 minus 1870, drum roll please. 153. Rapture fish! Do you get it? Rapture fish! 153! 153! 153! 153! Okay, I can't point this out. We are being shown so many, many things. I mean, get. Can you drink from a fire hose? I can't, but that's exactly what's happening right now. Are, are we looking up at the, at the beginning of birth pains? It's absolutely stunningly amazing. And I had, I, I'm, just, I'm just wanting to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's so many things that relate to this. And so did I cover that 153 in the last message? No, this is absolutely new. It's new stuff because I couldn't fit it in. The last one's two hours long, okay? And I'm trying desperately to make this shorter so that, you know, uh, that other people might be able to share it, look at it, and consider it, okay? Now, I want to be able to move forward with this because there was also, let me put that there, 1996. And I had mentioned, excuse me, how this time, right before this last message, as I was about to go on, how Holy Spirit had prompted me to do something I don't normally do. And that was to look up in Strong's. I don't do this a lot. I've done it a couple of times. This is one of those times. Holy Spirit told me, look up 1996 in Strong's. I went, I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't have even considered that because, like I said, that's generally something that I don't do. But I did it because Holy Spirit prompted me to do that. So Strong's, New Testament, 1996. That is the word episunago, okay? And what that means is to gather together besides, to bring together to others already assembled. And I want you to start thinking about these because this dream that I had is this, and that is the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. So shall we, uh, to, to, uh, you know what I'm talking about. So shall we ever be with the Lord, right? Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the full passage, chap, uh, verses 13 through 17. And so what do we have here? The gathering together the living, and the dead in Christ. That's our gathering together to be with Jesus. That's our gathering together. But there is another one to gather together, together against. So we see that in Micah and Zechariah. Uh, then we have a third one that is to gather together in one place. Same thing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 
And that's where we're going to be gathered together in one place, in the air. And he is going to, what is it, John chapter 14, where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And that's he coming to gather us to be with him in one place. Okay. Well, so I took this out and I, I thought my jaw was good. I had to pick it up, you know, <laughs> and put it back on because I'm thinking like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I wouldn't have thought to do that, but of course, why, why not? Why wouldn't I have thought that? Right. And so then what I pulled out is uh, one of the passages out of many that are there to be able to mention Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, where it says, and he shall send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four ends, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, am I trying to say that that's what this gathering is. No, that is a post-tribulation gathering. The first Thessalonian ones is a pre-tribulation gathering. Interesting, right? Which is why I say uh, that, uh, oh, we've got Cheryl asking, will this be a lot longer yet? Uh, if you're asking about the length of the message, it's going to be a little bit longer. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you're asking about how much longer it's going to be till we are harvested, not long at all. I was thinking that uh, as I was talking to Sister Paulette, the urgency with which Holy Spirit was like, I'm thinking like, am I going to have enough time to actually finish this message? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Anyway, so that's what the deal was. There are three harvest brothers and sisters. I've mentioned that numbers of times and uh, and people get upset about it and they say, no, 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 there's only one. And it happens before. No, 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 there's only one. And it happens after. And, and I'm just thinking like, guys, just ask Holy Spirit to open up your heart of understanding. Get rid of that stony heart that you have inside and have a teachable spirit. Our Holy Spirit's the comforter. Our Holy Spirit is, is the wisdom of God that's going to be able to, uh, to open up your eyes to the scripture. And when you see this, you can see, wait a minute, why do we have all of these scriptures that one person says it's pre-trib. One person says, it, no, it's mid-trib or pre-wrath. Another one says it's post-trib, whatever. It's because they all are true, right? The whole Bible is true. Wouldn't you agree? I would hope that you would. It's all from God. It's God-breathed. And so why do we have scriptures that look like it's pre-trib? Because it goes to the pre-trib. It discusses the pre-trib. And then why do you have mid-trib scriptures? Because it goes with the mid-trib harvest and the same for the post-trib, okay? Will there be a post-trib harvest? Yes, there will. Why? Because the Bible says so. Will there be a pre-trib harvest? Yes. Why? Because the Bible says so. Will there be a mid-trib harvest? Let me just say it a third time. Yes. Why? Because the Bible says so. Okay. And, and so when one of the things that I say about this is when you get past trying to staunchly say, no, I'm going to stay right here. This is what I'm going to, this has to be it. When you do that, you keep yourself from receiving this wonderful, glorious information that Holy Spirit wants to impart to you. So, Allow that to happen. Pray that Holy Spirit will open up your eyes and your heart to understanding, to hear the words of the Lord, and to see them in their context and understand these wonderful, deep, but awesome secrets that have now been revealed. Okay? All right. Now, 
Ah, thank you, Abba. Now I'm going to talk about something else, a way about in relation to the snow. Okay. So again, why would I be, why would I be having this? I mean, what did it mean? I've never forgotten it. I've never, other than my family and those friends and other other ones that thought I was just cuckoo out of my, my, my mind, um, what they ended up doing is they ended up, um, of course, you know, what, what, can you, what can you say? I'm not the type of person that says, hey, yeah, told you so. But, you know, the snow kind of spoke for itself, right? I did say it was going to happen. I did say it was God that showed me that. And here it is. So what does that mean? It was God, right? Okay. So there had to be a meaning to it. So one of the things that we talk about as far as it relates to the snow is I had another brother in Christ that had pointed out. And look, that's what I'm saying. I was not given this connection even though I've discussed it. And I, I'm thinking like, why didn't I get that? Why? Because it was for another person in the body of Christ to be able to give their part, their connection, their puzzle piece, so that we could add it to the picture. And that was that the snow may represent the rapture. Why? How could it represent the rapture in 2023? Well, we're going to discuss a lot about that and the connection that this particular brother in Christ was saying was using a passage out of the book of Jasher, chapter three, discussing about Enoch. Whoa, did that throw up a rapture flag, right? Enoch was and is the pre-tribulational type and shadow of the harvest. And when do we know that he was raptured? He was raptured at a snowfall, okay? Now, we're going to cover this. So I'm actually going to read you out of the book of Jasher. I've covered this in a previous message uh, where I discuss about how uh, in uh, previous God dreams, what God was showing me, what Abba had revealed to me through Holy Spirit was that we were going to be raptured in the winter. It was going to be a winter rapture for us. And But I'm thinking like, well, how does that then relate to because we've got the spring equinox and those types of things. Well, you also have to look at there is no spring in Israel. There's only winter and summer. And so I was trying to figure out, I was just thinking like, I did not connect the Enoch rapture uh, with the God premonition of the snowfall in April that I had in 1996. But this, I want you to listen to this passage, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read you out of the book of Jasher, chapter 3, and uh, verses 17 through 38. And the reason I'm going to discuss that, am I placing this above holy canon? Of course not. But there is, you know, the book of Jasher is mentioned in the scripture several times. And so what I'm going to do is talk about, and this gives us some more detail about Enoch that we don't necessarily get directly out of the scripture, right? So I'm going to discuss this, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more. And you're going to, I want you, as you listen to this uh, excerpt, I want you to think about rapture flags, if you will. Okay. All right. 
Starting in verse 17, this is chapter 3 of the book of Jasher. <clears throat> and it was in the year of Adam's death, which was the 243rd year of the reign of Enoch. In that time, Enoch resolved to separate himself from the sons of men and to secret himself as at first in order to serve the Lord. And Enoch did so, but did not entirely secret himself from them, but kept away from the sons of men three days and then went to them for one day. And during the three days that he was in his chamber, he prayed to and praised the Lord his God. And the day on which he went and appeared to his subjects, he taught them the ways of the Lord. And all they asked him about the Lord, he told them. Amen. Verse 20. And he did this, uh, did in this manner for many years, and he afterward concealed himself for six days and appeared to his people one day in seven. And after that once in a month, and then once in a year, until all the kings, princes, and sons of men sought for him and desired again to see the face of Enoch and to hear his word, but they could not. As all the sons of men were greatly afraid of Enoch, and they feared to approach him on account of the godlike awe that was seated upon his countenance. Therefore, no man could look at him, fearing he might be punished and die. And all the kings and princes resolved to assemble the sons of men and come to Enoch, thinking that they might all speak to him at the time when he should come forth amongst them, and they did so. Verse 22. <clears throat> And the day came when Enoch went forth, and they all assembled and came to him. And Enoch spoke to them the words of the Lord, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge. And they bowed down before him, and they said, May the king live! May the king live! And in some time after, when the kings and princes and the sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God, Behold, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven and wished to bring him up to heaven to make him reign there over the sons of God. And he had reigned over the son, as he had reigned over the sons of men upon earth. Ooh, ding, 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 should be a rapture flag and what the bride is going to do. Okay, think about that. Uh, verse 24, when at that time Enoch heard this, he went and assembled all the inhabitants of the earth and taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instructions. And he said to them, I have been required to ascend into heaven. I therefore do not know the day of my going. Hold on to your hats. Don't just say, like, oh, 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 no man knows the day or the hour. Okay, hold on to your pants here. Right now, we uh, just wait until I go, right? He said right then that he didn't know. Verse 26, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them instruction, and he reproved them, and he placed before them statutes and judgments to do upon earth, and he made peace among them, and he taught them everlasting life and dwelt with them sometime teaching them all these things. And at that time, the sons of men were with Enoch and Enoch was speaking to them and they lifted up their eyes and the likeness of a great horse descended from heaven and the horse paced in the air. And they told Enoch what they had seen and Enoch said to them, on my account, does this horse descend upon earth? The time is come when I must go from you and you and I shall no more be seen by you. Let me point out, there was the sign in the sky and we see that sign and he knows that because that sign has now been seen, 
he's got to go to heaven. So now he knows, right? Okay. And how are we going to know? Let's count the days. And then uh, let's see. And they verse 29. And the horse descended at that time and stood before Enoch and all the sons of men that were with Enoch saw him. And Enoch then again ordered a voice to be proclaimed, saying, Where is the man who delighteth to know the ways of the Lord his God? Let him come this day to Enoch before he is taken from us. And all the sons of men assembled and came to Enoch that day, and all the kings of the earth with their princes and counselors remained with him that day and Enoch then taught the sons of men uh, wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction and he bade them serve the Lord and walk in his ways all the days of their lives and he continued to make peace among them verse 32 and it was after this that he rose up and rode upon the horse and he went forth and all the sons of men went after him, about 800,000 men. And they went him, with him one day's journey. And the second day he said to them, return home to your tents. Why will you go? Perhaps you may die. And some of them went from him. And those that remained went with him six days journey. And Enoch said to them, every day, return to your tents, lest you may die. But they were not willing to return, and they went with him. And on the sixth day, some of the men returned and clung to him. And they said to him, we will go with thee to the place where thou goest. As the Lord liveth, death only shall separate us. And they urged so much to go with him that he ceased speaking to them. And they went after him and would not return. Verse 36. And when the kings return, they caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men that went with Enoch. And it was upon the earth and, and it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven into a war with a, uh, in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. Now, before I forget, let me stop. When did, uh, how, how many days was, uh, was it that Noah and his family were on the ark before the flood came? Seven days, right? Okay, so they knew that when they got there, that was going to be when he was going to ascend, right? Okay, so did they know beforehand that he was going to be going? Yes, they did, and they knew every day. So it was seven days journey, and so they all knew that when they got there, then that was when he was going to go. Um, verse 37, and on the eighth day, all of the kings that had been with Enoch sent to bring back the number of men that were with Enoch in the place from which he ascended into heaven. Now, this is where we're tying all this together in verse 38. And all those kings went to the place, and they found the earth there filled with snow. And upon the snow were large stones of snow. And one said to the other, Come, let us break through the snow and see, perhaps the men that remain with Enoch are dead and are now under the stones of snow. And they searched, but could not find him, for he had ascended into heaven. Okay? Now, one of the things that, that's very interesting uh, when, when you look at this, so how then do we see what I see is a connection then of snow with the rapture and then with this 1996 snow event that never occurred and uh, where i was that's what i'm saying obviously it snowed before 1996 right you understand what i'm saying i hope uh 
that, uh, that this is associated with the rapture. And I find it interesting because there are some people, uh, actually quite a large number of people that believe that it never rained on the earth during these days. Now I tend to disagree. However, let's for the benefit of argument to be able to say, what if that's the case? What if that's actually the case? And now they see snow, but they wouldn't have recognized it never would have snowed before, right? It never would have snowed, but here they see this snow and they look under the snow and he's gone because he ascended up into heaven. It's very interesting then that I can kind of see a similarity here with the, the snow in 1996 where it had never snowed there in North Texas before that time period in April until then. And so now I find it, and I never, I, I never connected with that. And it's not, uh, it, it's almost East, Easter, yes. And, and so I'm not going to call it Easter. If, if you don't mind, I call it Resurrection Day. And I would prefer to, to do that because I don't want to have, in, me personally, I don't want to have any connections with, you know, uh, uh, pagan gods and that sort of thing. But that's what I want to be able to, to point out. So there's the snow, but there's more. There's more. There's more. Okay. And uh, that is this. Um, let's see. We had uh, another sister in Christ that she pointed out this other thing. And this is what I want to point out too. So if, if, if you haven't seen my previous message on a winter rapture of the bride of Christ, I encourage you. It's a few back, but it, it, it discusses it about the, you can just look up the title and you can see it there. I encourage you to look at it. And that's what I was pointing to is this period of time right now. And it wasn't until my yesterday's message that I, uh, that I was released to give that Holy Spirit had me put together the snow in 1996. And we see that 1996 is gathering together in one place. We see how it, it shines here in you know, uh, with the book of uh, uh, the chapter three from the book of Jasher, talking about Enoch and how that it snowed then. And here's also something very interesting. Uh, uh, I had a, a sister in Christ who wrote to me saying, the heavens declare the times and seasons in which we are. Hello, Wayne. On which day in April of 1996 did you see the snow? According to Ricardo Garcia, he just had a, a message that just came out what, yesterday as well. Um, and he says, Purim will be this year on the 5th of April, perhaps our rapture date. Well, I had to write our sister back and to tell her, just as I've discussed with you, that it happened on the 5th of April, 1996. Interesting, right? Interesting. Now, am I saying that this is going to be the date of the rapture? No, I'm not. Uh, but I'm definitely saying if you are not watching during this period of time, that would be a foolish thing to do. Uh, I've never seen it so close, and, uh, and, and this is what I'm going to talk about here, but I'm going to talk about more, okay? I've, I've got this dream that we're going to have coming up, and this is turning into over an hour anyway, so uh, maybe I can try to get this down. All right, so April the 5th, interesting, interesting, and I find it, if, if you recall also that in another previous message, that I also discussed about this winter time also being uh, 
the bookends. I've talked about bookends because God has shown me so often about bookends, the opening of the window, the closing of the window, and, and on and on in various different ways. Well, in one of the last messages that I have given here, the bookends were from February the 14th to April the 9th, which is Resurrection Day this year. But that was supposed to be the closing of the bookends. So that's what he was showing, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm just I'm just wanting you to be able to to see. Look how close do we keep narrowing the focus and the focus down, right? So there's uh, this one uh, person talks about it being. Uh, now I am not. I haven't checked out. I did watch uh, Brother uh, Garcia's latest uh, message, but. I hadn't uh, noticed that he had said that Purim was going to be on this year on the 5th of April. That's that's quite interesting as I see it. And uh, and and I actually it made me think of something else. Everybody, I, I'm sure if you haven't, there there have been so many dreams about two moons rapture, right? And uh, you, you just do a Google search or you do a, a search on YouTube and you're going to find many, many ones, okay? Uh, and I, I, I just, uh, I, 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 there are just many. But when, before I got on here for this live stream here and this follow-up message, I had this kind of question that popped into my mind thinking about what could that be? So many people have thought about it and, and thought one thing. And I am actually, here is one of the thoughts that I had. Does it actually mean that you're going to see two moons? No, I don't think so. What I am thinking that that means is it's talking about two calendars. And it's talking about what the full moon will be on two different calendars. It's talking about two different days, right, that are going to be recognized as one. So what if we are celebrating Purim on one and what if we are celebrating Passover on another? They would, do you understand what I'm saying? That's, that's the issue. That's what I'm talking about, right? Uh, consider that. Consider that. They're both happening at the same time. And depending upon who you're talking about, like uh, Brother Ricardo Garcia, uh, is indicating and others indicating about how there is a difference of one month in the calendars. Uh, there's uh, uh, Brother Mike there at Repo Man 64. I tend to uh, uh, tend to believe more uh, that uh, the March 16th date, the day of equal parts, the equal lux. Uh, I tend to believe that that actually is it. That actually is it. And so what can we look at? But my point is when we start to add these things up, my dream showing the closing book in, wow, okay, between February the 14th and April the 9th in one of those messages. And now I'm looking at how we're seeing the closing book ends from the, from the perspective of my afterlife testimony. The very first message on this channel was my first afterlife testimony. And now I'm on my last message discussing the what I consider my closing book in afterlife and what that is pretending. So we're going to cover that in a minute. So I want you to consider, all right, ah, here's one that talks about Purim happening on the 5th of April. 
1996 uh, snow happened on the 5th of April. Uh, there are others that, that talk about, okay, so we've got Passover, uh, Dr. Uh, Barry All, and uh, I love you, Dr. Barry. Uh, and, uh, and he covers a lot of things. I, I like the, the Passover thing. And I, but I also, I really like the snowfall. I really like how this snowfall, you get snow in winter, right? How could we have this snowfall that could actually be related at, or as a symbol or as a type for us to see that it's related to the rapture? of the broad. I just think that that is just amazing, amazing. But that's not all, okay? We had another, uh, uh, oh yeah, so here's another one. We had our uh, sister from Seek Heavenly Things and she gets a lot of messages uh, from Jesus and she talks about how Purim isn't over yet. And that's what she's saying. So uh, uh, it, it's it's something to really keep in mind. I'm thinking like, hmm, some are talking about how there's this difference. Uh, I think we might uh, think about it because look at all of this snow that has been happening in the U.S. These feet and feet of snow happening over and over. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And it's going in later. I just want you to consider that, okay? Uh, it looks like we, we very well may be having a very soon winter rapture. Now, why is that 1996, as we're saying this again? Here's another, and I want to point this out too. There was also another interesting view, and it relates to our 1111 judgment. And this was another brother in Christ. And he writes, in the end of your latest live stream, brother, you talked about how our beloved Jesus told you that it would snow in the April of 1996. And it did indeed, as the Lord spoke. At the time, why he told you that didn't make any sense. But now it totally does. Brother, do you know what else looks like snow? Nuclear fallout powdered snow. Brother, I believe the Lord reminded you of that dream now because this April nukes will fly causing snow-like fallout. And he provided a screenshot where he discusses this. And I think this is quite interesting. Consider this. Consider this. Hold on. Since we, uh, I've covered uh, messages, many others have that said when we go up, you know, destruction comes down, right? Now, this was from the 1950s. It's from uh, a ship. It's about a ship called uh, Daigo Fukuru Maru, uh, otherwise known as Lucky Dragon Number 5. Uh, this Lucky Dragon Number 5 encountered the fallout from the U.S. Castle Bravo nuclear test at Bikini Atoll, near the Marshall Islands on March 1st, 1954. When the text, test was held, Lucky Dragon number five was catching fish outside the danger zone that the U.S. government had declared in advance. However, the test was more than twice as powerful as predicted and changes in weather patterns blew nuclear fallout in the form of a fine ash outside the danger zone. On that day, the sky in the west lit up like a sunset. Uh, the Maru was not damaged by the shockwave from the blast. However, several hours later, white radioactive dust made up of radioactive particles of coral and sand fell upon the ship. The fishermen attempted to escape from the area, but it took almost six hours to retrieve their fishing gear from the sea and process fish, mainly shark and tuna, caught in the lines exposing themselves to the radioactive fallout. 
the fishermen scooped the highly radioactive dust into bags with their bare hands. One fisherman reported that he took a lick of the dust that fell on his ship, likening the falling material to powdered snow. I, wow. I think that, you know, there, there, there is good reason to also consider this as well, because destruction is going to be coming and it is going to happen after our, um, after our departure, after the bride is raptured up, okay? And I just really, I really, really believe that this is, I have never been more so firmly convinced how close we are. Um, and, and, and it is going to happen. And I, I, I myself, I'm so excited. And I want you, brothers and sisters, I want you to be excited too. And if you don't know Christ, you are, you definitely, you definitely do not want to be here. But there's a Jesus that loves you, okay? This Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that God, Jesus, the Son of God, he came down in flesh and he paid a price. He died on the cross paying a price for your sin debt, for my sin debt, for everybody's sin debt because you can't pay it. And he offers it to you as a free gift. And I'm saying right now, before we finish this message, I'm giving you the opportunity right now to want to know this loving Jesus who loves you so much. And he wants to come and take you to be where he is. And you can do that now. If you will say in your heart, yes, not just an intellectual, but believe that this is true. These things that I'm showing you, just like God showed me, reveal that God is true. He's alive. He's living. And he is reigning forevermore. I'm, I'm telling you that if you will believe that he died on that cross from you as God in the flesh, that he was buried and he rose again from death after three days, you will be saved if you call on him. If you want to know that Jesus, you call out and tell him right now, Jesus, Jesus, I know you did it for me. I know you paid the penalty for my sin. I can't pay it. I'm so thankful that you did. I receive it. It's a free gift. I receive it from you now. I receive it from you now. Save me. Become my Lord and Savior of all my life. Take everything from me and give me all of yourself. Do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you've done that, oh, and I pray that you will. I pray that you will, brothers and sisters, because that will be the very best decision that you have ever made in this life. And you are about to jump and shout for joy. I want you to go out and if, you, if you've answered that prayer, if you've done that, go out and tell someone that you have just made Jesus your Lord and your Savior. Do it now. Don't wait. All right. Well, maybe you can wait till the end of this message, okay? <laughs> okay, let's let's go ahead and I just I love you all and I want you to do that. I want you to do that. All right. Now let's discuss my closing bookend. Now this closing bookend, this is one of the things that I wanted to be able to discuss as it relates to that. I really think my opening bookend, as I discussed earlier. It's the procession going to Jesus. It's the marriage, and it is the uh, uh, the union of the bride and the bridegroom. That's what all of that was, and it was done out of love. And it was Jesus dying on that cross that made that paid the price for him to get his bride. I I just. 
if you can put those two together, I just see these as these two bookends. So here in the second one that I have, which is seven years later, who can only do that? God can. Who's the only one that that that, that had this uh, amazing uh, premonition uh, about a snowfall that had never <laughs> happened before in the record record books, at least from the time uh, that uh, Noah had records? Wow, only God, only God, right? And so if you haven't heard it, I'm not going to cover this, this whole thing, but I am going to talk about one thing. And it was so, it was so painful for me, but I think I understand it now. At the time when the angel lifted me up, and so many people believe that angels are actually going to take us up uh, to the clouds. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the case, but I can tell you that in my second instance, I did have an angel lift me up and took me to Jesus. And uh, he's, as I say, he it's in heaven. We talk about everything, but he's, he brings me to Jesus, who is on the top of this mountain in heaven, and uh, and it, like I said, it looks like a pyramid. He's on the top of it, though. And he's where, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I just got another, another. Oh, oh thank you, Abba. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He's wearing this beautiful but simple white robe. Beautiful. And it has this gold band right here all the way around and it's part of the robe in his robe and uh and then the angel brings me to him but he makes a circle i'm, I'm reaching out i wanted to grab a hold of jesus right yes yes oh my goodness i've been waiting to come back so so strongly but he takes me and I make a complete circle around him and he brings me back in front of him and I'm perplexed. And like I said, he tells me, I don't want to talk about it because it's just so painful to me. Uh, he tells me it's not time yet. And, uh, and so I end up getting taken back. It was so painful. And I didn't know why for years, for years and years. And right before I, I come on to give this message again, I, I had another uh, person who had made a comment about circling the groom. And I went and just simply said, oh, Wow, wait a minute. I did a search and I came up with this simple uh, tradition. And this is a Jewish tradition in a wedding. It says the bride circles the groom seven times, symbolizing the creation of a new family circle and forming a wall of protection for the groom. Oh, wow. We are adapting this ritual for our ceremony. This was talking about the circling ceremony by circling each other. The circling symbolizes the creation of a new and protective home and the intertwining of our lives. And I'm just thinking seven years between. Now, I only circled him one time. I don't think that he was going to have me circle him seven times, but I, but I, then remember, wait a minute. It is, brothers and sisters, it is the closing bookend. It is the closing bookend. And it all has to do as this whole thing from beginning to end, this entire year, up until now, what we have is bookends that are telling us about the rapture of the bride of Christ. That is what it has been about this whole time.
this whole time. And so there, there I am again. So in other words, there, there I am in heaven with Jesus. I'm circling him. This was after seven years. And I, so I think that that was, is what actually we see as the circling seven times because it's divine completion. But I think that the point was that he was showing me about the, the it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. I, I just can't, I can't explain to you. It was not like the death that I went through the first time. That was so incredibly painful. But the uh, but everything about it, it, heaven, Jesus, the Father, Abba, everything about it was just absolutely amazing. But it was my taste of the heavenly union and the consummation in heaven. That's what it represented. It's talking about the bride from the beginning and then the circle. That's the bride that circles the bridegroom, because right there at the end, we are, I, as a representative of the bride, I was gathered up so gently and wonderfully and excitedly. I was in heaven and I was taken to Jesus and where I am then circling him as they do in the wedding ceremony, right? The Jewish wedding ceremony where they circle the bridegroom. And uh, I, 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 I just really, that's what it is. And I really want you to see that's what this is. Now, let me tell you the dreams, the two dreams that I had this early morning. Now, they're very short but very profound, and they were both the same. And that's what we know is that uh, that that is also confirmation when you have dual dreams. They're the same dreams, right? In this dream, I was standing uh, outside, and and then all of a sudden, as I'm standing outside. I'm looking up at the sky. Now, I'm not knowing at the time I'm actually doing this why I'm looking up, but I notice that there is something that initially like light comes down from heaven and covers me, okay? And I look down at myself and I'm wearing this beautiful white robe now and and i was thinking like whoa and it's it's wider than pure snow okay and there's no wrinkle on it there's there's nothing it's like it's permanently pressed it like it can't have a wrinkle and i'm looking at it and it goes down to to my feet and and it fits me perfectly and i'm thinking like wow that's nice and then i look back up and then instantly i am inside this chamber and i knew it was a chamber and inside this chamber there's other people that were already there and then i'm there with them and every single person in there, it didn't, it was a large room, but it, it didn't seem, it didn't seem so beyond belief large. It, it, and it looked like all the floors and, and walls and everything were white marble uh, type, very bright. And everyone else in there had on the same white robe. And everyone was so happy. And we were seeing each other. And we were looking at And I started to recognize people. And, and I'm seeing like all of this. And I instantly knew I was in the wedding chamber. That's what it was. 
And when that realization came and I looked then towards the middle where everyone was for my Jesus, for the bridegroom. And as soon as I looked there, that's when I woke up. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that is, I saw the transformation of myself into my transformed body. I was wearing this beautiful white robe. And I say beautiful because it seemed there was the difference. The one difference, it was pure white. The only one, that's why I relate this to the difference, is that Jesus had on the very same type of robe, except he had this gold band around it that was part that was part of the robe. It was sewn in, like we would say, right? So almost like it would be his crown in a sense, right? You recognized him. He had this golden paps, right? Golden uh, thing around his, just right below his uh, chest. But every one of us, it was all pure white. And, uh, and we were so excited and we were all together with him in the wedding chamber. I'm thinking, brothers and sisters, this is so clear to me about this being the end. I am, I'm beside myself. I'm beside myself. All of these things happen to me, yes, but they happen to me so that I could tell you, brothers and sisters, I can tell you, I went through all of this because I believe that Jesus knew I would be obedient and I would tell you everything. And now it is, now it is that moment. It all fits together. If you look at my channel, you will see it's right at exactly one year. The very first one being my afterlife testimony, number one. And now we are just finishing talking about afterlife testimony number two, followed by the transforming of our cells into our resurrected bodies, and then being clothed in white raiment, and then standing before the thing. That's the other thing I wanted to be able to say, to stand before the Son of Man. We were all standing. It wasn't like we were all lounging around or anything. We were all standing and we were all focused around this central point that Jesus was there. I, I just want you to know that's going to happen. Look up, brothers and sisters, because our redemption draws so incredibly near. It can happen any moment now. Now, I'd say any moment, there's going to be those that might say otherwise, but we're the barley bride, the barley bride, and we are being harvested right now. Could it happen on uh, what people are saying could still be Purim? Yes. Could it happen on what people are saying could be Passover? Yes. Could that happen on what might see my closing book in on the other ones was February 14th to Resurrection Day, April the 9th. Could it happen on that? Yes, it can. I'm saying that all things point to this period of time only and not past it. I, you know, can, can I be mistaken or can the Lord show me something else? Of course he can. But I think that, that right now, because he's sovereign, it's all about him. It's not anything about us. And, uh, but I'm telling you, I love my Jesus. I love my Jesus. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. And I just, I want you to know, he says, arise and come away with me. Amen. Amen. That's in the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10. 
I it just, oh my goodness. And what is the very last verse in uh, one of the last verses in our Bible say, the spirit and the bride say, come. And I hope that you will be with me as I say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let that be the case. I love you all, brothers and sisters, and I see you in the air. Maranatha. Bye-bye now.